Good morning, dear saints, and blessed Epiphany, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Tuesday, January 16th, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. Even though my voice is strained this morning, I promise I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Philippians is an epistle written by the Apostle Paul from prison, probably in Rome, and it expresses his deep affection and spiritual guidance for the believers in Philippi. In this first chapter that we'll talk about today, Paul discusses themes of joy and fellowship and the advancement of the gospel despite his imprisonment. He emphasizes his confidence in Christ and his desire for the spiritual growth of the Philippians. Paul also reflects on important things like life and death, and he underlines his commitment to Christ's mission, and this sets the tone for the entire letter. Thank you to all you listeners out there tuning in over the air or online at KFUO.org. Maybe you're using that KFUO app or your favorite podcasting app or smart speaker. I'm so glad you're here. Settle in. Open your hearts and your minds. We're about to begin. Thy Strong Word is graciously supported in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. You can learn more about what they do for the church and the gospel at lhfmissions.org. And if you have any questions or comments about today's show, maybe you just want to say hi, email me, pastorboo at gmail.com. Give me a call, 1-800-730-2727, or find me on Facebook. Joining us this morning is regular contributor to the show, the Reverend John Shank. He's the pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois, and I'm glad to have him on. Good morning, Pastor Shank. Good morning, brother. How are you doing today? You said your uh, your voice is a little yeah, under the weather. Sorry I don't know if it's coming. That. Yeah, I don't know if it's coming through or not. But yeah, I have a pretty bad voice. I I have this uh, singer's soothing throat spray, professional strength herbal supplement, but it's not really doing the trick this morning. But it <laughs> tastes like it tastes like gin and battery acid. So well, uh, uh, but in any case, I hope that you'll be doing uh, most of the heavy lifting today. At least that's my prayer. Of course, I'll jump into. <laughs> Um, With a recommendation like that, I'm sure they'll start their uh, sponsorship of oh, yeah. KFUO <laughs> real soon. Checks well, are yeah, on the a, way. It's a good thing we're not a commercial station, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. Yeah, now it's just now occurring to me. Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned the brand name. Oh, well. But they're not a sponsor, so oh, well. No, they're not. Uh, they're not. <laughs> not after that. <laughs> but you know who's great? The Lutheran Heritage Foundation. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, I tell you what, why don't you go ahead and uh, open us up with prayer. I'm going to do a couple coughing off the air and uh, see if I can get back into shape. <laughs> yeah, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, as we gather to study your Holy Word, we do so in thanksgiving, for you have gathered us all together as one family, as a body of believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ who have a citizenship of a kingdom that has no end, your kingdom. Be with us now in the midst of every trial. Be with pastor in the midst of sickness. Grant him healing according to your good and gracious will. Be with all those who are suffering. Be with the whole body of Christ in every need so that we may supply each other's needs in our prayers and our encouragement. And the joy that is ours, because we know you, O Lord, in the person of your Son who has come and has dwelt with us to be our Savior, help us to know and have that joy of knowing that all of our days, all of our days in our eternity rests in our Savior's hands through the same Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, brother, today we're opening up a brand new epistle. Um, of course, it's not new. It's been around for a long time, but it's new to us today. We've been, we just finished up with Ephesians, and now we're going into Philippians chapter 1. Might be a good idea to catch people up with what Philippians is all about. You know, I, I mentioned that he's writing from jail. We think um, maybe in Rome. Some people actually think it could have been in Ephesus or Caesarea. Uh, I don't know that we know for sure, but what should we know about this text going into it? Sure. Um, and if people want to do a little background uh, research, uh, they can go back to the book of Acts and go to Acts chapter 16. And that's the second, you know, the beginning of the second missionary journey in which uh, Paul and uh, Silas at this time, there we have the separation of, 
uh, Barnabas and and uh, John Mark. And so uh, Paul goes with Silas and then also picks up Timothy along the way. And they go on the, the missionary journey all around. And that's also where they're called. He is called. So they are called over to Macedonia. And it's it's there in Macedonia that they go to Philippi. And it's there in Philippi that uh, they suppose that there would be a gathering of believers on the Sabbath day. So they go out along the riverside and that's where they would uh, find that there is a gathering there, a gathering of women in prayer. And so they meet Lydia. And if we remember Lydia, she is the one who is a seller of purple goods, uh, a little LWML uh, connection there of purple. Um, And uh, so she encourages them to stay. And so they do stay, but when they stay, um, <laughs> there is a, another girl in, uh, in introduced, and this girl has, uh, she's demon-possessed. She's got this uh, demonic uh, force that uh, grants her some uh, divination. Uh, her owner, she's a slave girl, her owners are using her uh, for financial gain, uh, fortune-telling, those kind of things. But she is proclaiming that uh, these are, are men of God, uh, but she's doing it every day and all the time to the point that it's annoying to Paul. And so he casts out the spirit. They are annoyed that he he just ruined their gain. So they are taken up, uh, Paul and Silas, and they're put in. Uh, first, they are uh, dragged and beaten, and they're thrown in prison. Uh, without any trial, which is against the Roman law, and and it's there in the in the midnight that they're praying and singing of hymns, that there is a, an earthquake and the the doors are open, the bonds are 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 loosened, and uh, when the jailer comes, uh, he assumes that they have escaped, which means uh, death for him, so he's about to kill himself where Paul calls out not to harm himself. Uh, he then asks them, what, what do I need to be, to be saved? And, uh, and he's, t- they're t- he's told to believe, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be saved. Uh, this is for you and for your household. And he's baptized him and his family, uh, him and his household. And, uh, and he ministers back to, to Paul and to Silas. He, he uh, puts food before them. He washes their wounds. And then, of course, as I said, then they are washed. They are baptized. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, quite the story from uh, Philippi and uh, that's uh, the establishment there. And, and then, as you said, well, the background is that we see it in the jailer there as they have received Christ and they start ministering to Paul for whom they have received Christ from through through. God's working, the working of the Holy Spirit, but through his servant Paul, they give joy to God and they they show it through the care for the ministry of Paul. So they have offerings and, and gatherings. They they bring he Paul brings that to Jerusalem. Um, and here, when Paul makes his appeal to Rome and, and to Acts, makes his appeal to Rome and to the emperor. Now he's going to, to Rome. He's in uh in this uh, um, house-bound imprisonment. Uh, it's not like our system where if you're in prison, the, the prison itself will put food before you and clothing and all these things. You know, you had have to supply that for yourself as you're in chains. So other people have to, to tend to your care. And so um, people from Philippi, Philippians, come with aid and an offering. And so... Um, they are gathered. Uh, one of them gets quite sick and is almost to the point of death. So he is writing about his care, about their his thanksgiving for their offering, their their concern for him. He's talking about his joy. He's talking about what has God has done uh, through the proclamation of the gospel through this time of imprisonment, and um, in warning and encouragement. Uh, in the midst of all of life, you know, to rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, so the sense of joy is uh, in the background as he writes uh, Philippians, because they've got this great partnership in the gospel. 
You know, when I was thinking of a title for this particular episode, I, I toyed with the title uh, Letter from Roman Jail. I was trying to play off like Letter from a Birmingham Jail uh, only because, you know, we see – Dr. Martin Luther King, when he wrote Letter from a Birmingham Jail or Birmingham City Jail, you know, he's writing with a lot of hope in the future. He's writing with uh, an intent to persuade those um, to to see things in a better light. And, and he's in jail for unjust reasons. And, and that's really kind of what's happening with Paul here. He's in jail for unjust reasons. And yet, as you've been talking about, he has this wonderful joy and this perspective on the future through his faith in Christ, which undoubtedly Pastor Martin Luther King Jr. certainly also had. Uh, and so I just thought it was a neat connection. I, I abandoned that, though, because I didn't think people would get it. But still, I, I, I do think that, um, yeah, we, we see that same kind of thing. He begins in joy and it sets the tone for the whole letter. And you, and you kind of wonder, like, if I were in jail, I guess you don't have a lot else to do. But what compels you to write a letter? And then, of course, in that letter – be so overwhelmingly thankful and, and prayerful and pointing to Christ. Yeah. I, you know, I, it's hard to imagine and I'm glad I, I struggle in my imagining what it'd be like in jail. I'm glad mm -hmm. that I don't have to be in jail and we don't have to desire it. It's not like our salvation is in the greatness of our suffering, but as a Christian, one, we were uh, meeting with a district president yesterday and in our study, um, we were talking about, you know, it was a study of uh, Peter. And at the end of first Peter, there's this reality that Christians will suffer. You know, if you, if you're, right. if you're bearing the name of Jesus, you will suffer for the sake of Christ. People will make fun of you. People will malign the name. All these things will happen, but it's not like, well, there's a differentiation. Well, you suffer more, you get, you know, you're a better, better Christian. Well, God is the one who's in charge of all of it. But in the midst of our suffering, um, I think the joy is in the fact that um, of our fellowship. You know, we 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 have this fellowship of uh, I think it wasn't it Scholz um, wrote that or is is writing that or wrote that the fellowship of his sufferings. We we have this fellowship in Christ into his suffering, um, so that as we suffer, we we are united with him. We're, we're united with Christ in his suffering and we're united to the body of Christ that suffers. So you are not forgotten. You know, what a joy it is to know that Christ, Christ knows where you are. Christ knows your struggle. Christ hasn't abandoned you and the body of Christ hasn't abandoned you either. So we need to gather to and gather with the ones that suffer, right? It's mm -hmm. maybe it's a temptation to, um, to gather with people who don't suffer. Um, but that's probably probably the ones that we should, you know, maybe have, avoid people that don't suffer at all. Um, <laughs> no, uh, we want to be gathered to the ones who struggle in the faith and and um, because of the faith. And as we're gathered together, we have great encouragement in that fellowship. You know that that we are the body of Christ. What grace we have in Him. Yeah, and I, and I think that's another issue, too, that people can fall off the horse on. You know, we certainly don't seek out suffering, um, and, and we certainly shouldn't necessarily always try to avoid suffering because it will come. But as you said earlier, you know, our faith isn't um, measured by the amount of suffering we face, nor is our faith measured by uh, how much suffering we avoid. It's just a fact. Suffering exists, and so when we are in those situations, we can certainly uh, connect that suffering to Christ. I'm going to go ahead and read, to the best of my ability, the first, um, oh, let's do the first 10, 11 verses. Here we go. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's only two verses. I said I'd read to 11, but I, I fibbed. I'm going to stop there. Uh, yeah. Just looking at these two verses, already a couple of things are popping out. Pretty standard uh, opening customary greeting here at the top, but we see that he has a um, a co-sender, right? Uh, yeah. Tell us about um, the fact that Timothy is involved in this, and then he mentions overseers and deacons. It's probably worth 
reminding folks exactly what those terms uh, refer to? Sure. So um, one, we have uh, we have Paul as the main author. He's the one who is, well, it, it might be in someone else's name, but he is the one who is uh, authoring this. This is his words, obviously being led by the Holy Spirit. So Timothy isn't uh, telling him what to say, but is his fellow servant. And um, he is the one for whom has his... Uh, connection to Paul in such a, a beautiful way that Paul becomes a father of the faith to to him. He has a wonderful mother and a grandmother that we hear in uh, the, the letter that Paul writes to Timothy as a young man, and he himself is an overseer. Uh, he himself is one who has been called by, by Paul and is sent in very difficult situations like to Ephesus. And um, so he is, uh, he is with him here in, in Rome and, and, uh, and will be, uh, um, will be sent uh, on his way to, to, to minister to God's, to God's people. Uh, so, so yeah, you can take a look at Acts 16 again and see that uh, there's some uh, very, um, deep connections between Paul and Timothy and, and things that Paul does to Timothy there so that he has an inroads into preaching the gospel, the, the willingness to suffer in the flesh uh, that Timothy is willing to do uh, for the sake, the needs of his brother. Um, so, yeah, you can learn a lot, um, obviously, from you know going back to Acts as we're reading the epistles. Um, and then, as you said, you wanted us to uh, take a look at uh, overseers and uh, and deacons. So, as we take a look at uh, the the terminology here, overseers, uh, episcopoi, uh, uh, so uh, episcopal overseer or um, bishop. Uh, so, if you take a look at uh, Paul's letter to Timothy and Titus, Timothy, First uh, Timothy, chapter three, um, his. Uh, what our um, responsibility, what our needs for an overseer, and he kind of lays out what an overseer uh, has to have. It's not like those are unique, like the uh, husband of one wife, uh, not a, a drunkard, uh, not uh, uh, scandalizing the church in many different ways. It's not like, well, if you're not a, a pastor, you can be these things. No, these are, are true for all of us, but they're especially true for the preaching of the gospel so that we don't scandalize the gospel. So as we're um, looking out, we, we, uh, we're we looking for men who are apt to teach. Um, and then for a, uh, a deacon, a servant, you can take go back to the uh, book of Acts there and see the, the struggle that the um, apostles were having at uh, tending to the tables, the needs, uh, the physical needs of the church, and especially those who are widows and orphans and and the, the needs of the poor. And so they establish uh, the deacons who will who will care for the physical needs so that the preaching of the gospel would not be stopped. So again, letting scripture interpret scripture, we would uh, go to places like that to help us learn about the, the roles of the servants of the church and how did they serve the church? Um, and they, they did so that, the, the, so that the preaching of the gospel may, may go on. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's keep on going then. So now as promised through verse 11, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So he starts talking to the Philippians in very encouraging language, right? I mean, just loving, warm, pastoral language. Um, 
probably more pastoral than I'm usually able to muster up. I mean, just he's writing from prison and he's just talking about how he loves his people so much. It's it's amazing. I, I think I'd be griping if I was sitting in prison. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And and yet, um, like we like we said, the there is the the reality that they did not abandon him who was in prison. They didn't look at him and say, well, um, we want a we want a pastor who doesn't get put in prison. We want a, a successful <laughs> pastor, right? Which, like, which no, to be honest, seems kind of fair, but not in this instance, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we want we want one um, that will bring us, uh, you know, a little more success. Uh, no, he, they were seeing that that their their love for him would continue, and uh, and in that. And in that he is filled with thanksgiving. And um, yeah, you know, you can see, I, and I, I do the same um, with my congregation. I'm sure you do it. You're often grabbing um, quotes from these kind of letters from Paul to then start our letters to our own, con- when we're writing our own congregation, um, to be reminded of the partnership we have in the God. We are partners in the gospel, pastors and congregation together. We have a good news and we're partners in spreading that good. This is not just a pastor's job to spread the good news. And it's not just, it, we have a partnership in it. We're a partnership in the in the fact that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We have, we have one head and the one head is Jesus. And he keeps reminding them of that, that, uh, that they would abound all the more in love, that, that they would be looking forward to the day of Christ coming, the resurrection, because they have a citizenship in heaven. And, uh, you know, uh, these things are kind of subtle, you know, that Paul, remember, he he cites his citizenship of why he shouldn't have been beaten like he was in Philippians. And the, those in, in leadership had to come to the, he wasn't going to leave the jail. No, bring them to me, right? Bring them to me. And uh, we got something to talk about because they shouldn't have beat me like this. I'm a citizen. Ph- Philippi was... Um, he had such a uh, standing in in uh, the Roman culture that it was it was like it was a um, a uh, a city in Italy. It was such a uh, such a city, even though it was in Greece. And so they it would be illegal. They did something illegal to a Roman citizen. So they had to come and apologize, and they actually have to apologize. And then you know when he's going to Rome, he is he is citing his citizenship in that. Uh, um, in that earthly kingdom. And now he's going to be quoting that we have a far greater citizenship. We have this, we've got this place with Christ and there is a, um, a day of Christ coming. Our King is coming and we will be filled um, uh, to his praise and glory. So um, he, his, his encouragement to them is to look forward to uh, the day of Christ appearing. It's not like Christ is not with us now. And it's not as if his uh, kingdom hasn't come now, but it will be manifested. It will appear and all will see him and all will see what is ours already. I think verse six is pretty important for us to remember because he says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So uh, lots are packed in there. One, of course, is that God is the one who does this faith making in our hearts. So all the things that he's thankful for, it's it's not that he's not thankful for their own efforts. Of course he is. But he also reminds them that their efforts are just you know that which flows from the work of God within them. But what really comforts me is that he talks about it bringing to completion at the day of Jesus. So not only do we get look get to look forward to this being perfected in Christ when he returns, but it's also a comforting reminder that, you know, he's not done with us yet in those moments of failures, in those moments of sin, in those moments of, of, of just, um, you know, whatever struggles we face, even suffering that God's not done with us. And, and that gives hope for the future. Yeah. And it's, it's a text I'm sure for you too, that we often give as a, a confirmation verse, right. Mm-hmm. Um, to be reminded in confirmation verses is, you know, have been passed down to us or for, for two different days, right? For the day of their confirmation and then also for the day for the funeral to encourage the family. And what great encouragement for the family to hear that this person, this person who has died in the faith, they're not outside, but they're inside of the one who worked it in them, worked this great faith in them by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit and has 
led them all the days of their life, even in the midst of needing to be brought back to repentance like we do every day. But also here in their death, God has not abandoned, um, but has given his promise that he will bring it to completion at the day of our Lord. At the day of the resurrection, we'll see with our eyes what the Lord has been doing by the powerful working of his Holy Spirit. When he talks about imprisonment, both in my imprisonment in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you know, so Paul's been imprisoned a lot. <laughs> I, I think it's worth letting people know, though, that uh, like here in the United States, you can go to jail without being um, shown to be guilty of anything. Um, typically, jails you, you, is where you hold people until they are able to see a judge or a magistrate. Um, if you do end up with a sentence and it's less than a year, most locations you'll just spend that in jail. If it's over a year, you actually go to a prison for punishment. Well, the Romans were very similar in the fact that jails weren't really places where people were being punished, but rather held. Paul is in these jails all the time and in house arrest in Rome and uh, probably in Ephesus at this moment, maybe, um, or, or other places. But the point is, you know, he's in jail a lot. But he's, as you've already pointed out, it's not like he's not then also, um, I guess, fighting the charges, so to speak. But what's important is that he's using that opportunity in jail or, you know, waiting trials or whatever. He's using that opportunity to continue to proclaim the gospel. I, I think Paul has resolved to see these punishments as merely, I shouldn't say merely, but but as opportunities that God is given them. I think that's how he can also sort of talk about how his suffering, because nobody wants to be in jail, um, is connected to Christ. Because if it weren't for that, look at all these people that he'd never have access to for the gospel. And, and that really speaks to my heart about how much we as a church isolate ourselves. Not that we should be all going to jail for any reason, but but we isolate ourselves from the people that sometimes need the gospel message the most. Yeah. And there are times and maybe after the break, we can, there's more coming up that we'll bring it up that we can talk more about this because it's so, so powerful that wherever we go, wherever we go in this day, wherever our members and listeners are going and traveling, we should be a gospel people. We should be bringing you about with us and sharing the gospel in simple ways, um, but in profound ways that we should be willing to share the good news because wherever you go, there are people that are struggling, right? And we can pray. Hey, can I pray for you? Hey, can um, you know? Can I share something with you? What is my hope? That even when I'm struggling, even when I get diagnosis, that I know that the Lord is with me and He hasn't abandoned me, right? So He, this is definitely a great opportunity. That this is a vehicle. These uh, that is, is that He's being moved along from place to place and person to person. That he he just um, it just comes from his very the gospel is going to come out of his very pores and definitely from his very lips. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, I think this is a good place to take a pause. So let's do that. Folks at home, don't go anywhere. Just a few moments. We're going to come back and Pastor Shank and I will keep on going through Philippians chapter one. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back, folks, to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. Don't forget that you can reach out at PastorBoo at gmail.com, on Facebook, or by phone, 1-800-730-2727. doesn't cost you a dime to call. 
All right. Now back to our text. So, um, yeah, so we haven't really we have a lot of text to get through, of course, but we, we're just touching on this first section. And um, he, he says, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I, and I believe it. You talked about the gospel just coming out of his pores and and not only in his desire to share the good news with new people, but to fellowship with the people of God. And, you know, I, and I don't mean this in a crass way, but, but sometimes, you know, I, I think we shouldn't have to beg Christians to come to church. We spend a lot of time as pastors just trying to convince people that church is what they need. And, and yet in the Bible, we see how faith just, just compels people to gather around God's word, receive his gifts and with his people. I, I know you have some shut-ins too that, that they, they want more than anything to be in the house of God. And yet it's such a struggle like to try to convince some Christians that, that it's worth doing. Yeah. It, yeah, that's a, it is, it is difficult though. I, I find great encouragement uh, from those that we didn't have to feel like we're strong arming into the church. They, they come because they, they know, they know who is there. They, they know what we are, the one whom we receive as we gather together in his name, you know, they are encouraging us as they come to the Lord's top, they uh, table and uh, with tears in their eyes because um, of the grace of God. I, you know, we are carried along. I often feel uh, like we're being carried along as pastors through the faithfulness of our members. It far exceeds my faithfulness, you know, that mm-hmm. they had some members that come to church. I, I don't know. There was a, uh, a pastor that would put something kiddingly on, uh, on uh, half kiddingly, I guess, probably on on the face Facebook or on uh, Twitter or whatever it's called now, um, yeah. talking about you know weather is going to be so cold that the only people in church uh, will be the uh, elderly and the uh, sick or something like that. Like, <laughs> yep. Yes, you know, it's like that was Hans Feeney, by the way. It was great. <laughs> yes, you know, it, and he said it a lot funnier than I did, um, but uh, you. Know, and it was true, you know, we we still had members there and we rejoiced together. Of course. But the ones ones who were there are the ones who are filled with such such joy in Christ that it's like that they, they would go through, you know, all the snow. They would go through all the mm-hmm. cold. They would do it it doesn't matter. And they uh because they know Christ and they know the joy of being forgiven. And they know the joy of being in his grace. Um, and as much as we are like, oh, man, I want, we, need, we need to encourage our people to come to church. But the reality is we want to encourage them is what you're saying is, you know, we want them to encourage them to know Christ. We want them to know Jesus. They want, we want them to know what it is to be forgiven. We want them to know what it is to receive the grace of God and, and to have the one um, who made the heavens and the earth is the one who comes to fellowship with them. You know, he sought he sought out Philip and Nathaniel, and that's that one is seeking you out. Um, so yeah, it's, it's well, and, it's you know, frustrating. And, and Pastor Feeney's um, post there, I, it, it offended some people because you know, obviously, it's a little law based. You can feel it that way, but you know, just to explain it in case people misunderstand. You know, like in, in Haiti, for instance, when I was there, people would walk miles to get to church like like they had a need for it. Uh, the elderly and the sick. I think the reason why he picked those is because look at it. Right. We see that those who are spiritually mature recognize their need. Those who are sick have a reason to recognize their need. So a lot of that comes to spiritual maturity. And, and, and why do pastors want people in church? Um, you know, I, it, it sounds again, not to be crass, but like, I don't get paid anymore if more people are there. So, so the reason is out of love for them because of what Christ gives verse 10 in Philippians, Paul explains it just as you did. He says, so that you may approve of what is excellent, be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. That's why we gather. And so are there days that I don't want to go to church? Of course, you know, but, but, but I look into my heart and I go, but it's something I need. You know, it's like being sick and you, and you just don't feel like eating and maybe you don't for a while, but at some point you go, well, I have to eat something. Well, I think it's the same thing with faith. Even if our sinful nature says, oh gosh, you know, it, it's a little bit of a chore or whatever. And it can be, 
Uh, um, no, but but you need it. And, and I think that does come with maturity. So, yeah, it's it's definitely a fascinating dynamic and not one I wanted to derail the conversation with, but I just thought it, it's just what popped in my head. Yeah, and his um, his Thanksgiving, which started the letter, came from a recognition of what he has been given. And so right. when we struggle in our Thanksgiving, when we struggle with our joy, we have to remember what we have been given in Christ. And then that's where the sense of joy and Thanksgiving comes from. Well, let's keep on going. Let's pick up with verse 12, and he continues. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Uh, we're going to pause there. That's sort of the middle of verse 18. So so he says he's going to rejoice. He he puts up these two different people, those who are preaching from envy and rivalry and others from goodwill. And, and, and I, I think it's interesting because he says the former uh, do it out of selfish ambition, but to afflict me in my imprisonment. What What is he getting at here? Yeah, so we have the – we definitely have the reality of the the Judaizers and the ones who will be doing uh, some preaching and even preaching against against Paul while he is away, and so we see that in other letters too that that there are those who preach again, you know, so like he comes, establishes a church, he establishes a relationship with them and such a, as we can see it throughout this letter, such a loving fatherly, you know, parent like relationship. And then these other people come in and try to sever that relationship. And again, it's not, it's not a relationship with Paul that saves us, but we have a relationship with Paul because he is in Christ. He is giving us, the truth of the gospel, because Jesus has sent him to to them himself to bring the the pure pure gospel and the and the gifts that Christ has given, and so to be um, to be separated from him, it's often so that they themselves can be puffed up, so that they themselves can be be shown to be the true apostles, or they claim other apostles uh, like uh, James or whomever, so that they can um, kind of kind of cut these sheep off from their from the under shepherd and then ultimately cut them off from Jesus but even so there's still still a preaching of Christ um but maybe sometimes uh selfishly uh to to gain a, their own following so sometimes Paul as he says here as as long as Jesus is being preached he's going to rejoice um but there is a sense of uh, rivalry between um, the ones that come in later and, and trying to gain for themselves and and Paul who is doing it because he actually loves them. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's quite a struggle. I imagine some of these detractors were probably the Judaizers, those who didn't like, you know, Paul's approach to the gospel. But <laughs> just imagine, you know, this is the felicitous inconsistency that we've talked about a couple times on this show. When we talk about our fellow um, Christians in different flavors of Christianity, different traditions, and, and they preach things that well we don't agree with, but but we can still step back though and go, it's still a happy inconsistency though that like they say that people are already condemned, for instance, in double predestination, uh, but they go preach Jesus anyway. So I, I see that's kind of what he's doing. He's like, well, listen, these guys are out there telling you know Gentiles they have to basically become Jews through these rituals before they can become a Christian. I don't like that. But I do like that Christ is being proclaimed, so I guess I'll rejoice in that. I mean, it's a very spiritual, mature position, which I guess you can uh, expect from Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As he kind of is seeing that the word is going out. I mean, even um, 
even in circumstances that would seem pretty dire or what good can come out of this, like his imprisonment, like the verses before that, his imprisonment, he can see, oh, look at these guards are hearing the gospel. <laughs> they know I'm here, not because I've did anything wrong, but I'm here because of Jesus. And they're hearing that. And then they are being brought to the faith. Look what God is doing. And then he can apply that in other circumstances. And we should too, right? We should apply um, the knowledge that God is the Lord of of all <laughs> to every circumstance that we're going through. It doesn't mean that everything is good. And you you brought that out. It's not good anytime that, that uh, false doctrine is being taught. But what is good is when Christ is being taught, even by people who um, have have some errors in other places. So um, he can uh, he can say, well, what good can come of that? Well, I guess Jesus is being preached here, that Christ crucified for you is being preached, even when um, they don't have the fullness of the gospel or the purity of the gospel, Christ still is being preached. Just like, you know, what good can come of, of him being in prison? Uh, I had an interaction with somebody the other day, just yesterday, and he was struggling with a new illness. And I didn't know him. He didn't really know me. Actually, he kind of heard that we were on uh, KFUO a few times. So it was a KFUO plug. He's like, are you on KFUO? Um, and I uh, and I was doing a chapel. And so he stopped and, and he wanted to talk afterwards. And and it's just these situations where it's like, God, God, you are the only one who could have aligned our paths. I would have never met him. We were, you know, uh, many, many miles, uh, tens of miles uh, apart and where we live and where we would have interacted. But you brought us together at this moment so we could encourage each other in the faith. I found encouragement and I could bring to him the gospel in his situation of his sickness. So God is the Lord and he He is definitely in control of all of our steps. So um, while we go about, preach the gospel, preach the gospel, be ready to give the reason for our hope wherever we go and, and just rejoice in how God uses that for the building up of the body of Christ. Cause we're built up, they're built up and God, our heavenly father is glorified. He says, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. And he continues, yes, and I will rejoice 19 for knowing that through your prayers and the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you. So as we read these verses, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's if you read more into it than should be because of your state of mind or whatever. But I, I've often looked at these passages and I've seen within Paul a struggle that so many out there face. He says, for to me to live is Christ, of course, and to die, gosh, he gets to be with Jesus. But, of course, being here is fruitful labor and he knows that God has a purpose for him. What I think is startling to me is this phrase – Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I, I feel like it's almost like, you know, I mean, he doesn't have a choice between living or dying. So what does he mean by this? I mean, he's not making a decision on whether or not he's going to try to depart and be with Christ, is he? I mean, how do we interpret that? Because I feel like that could be dangerous if misinterpreted. Yeah, um, I, I guess I find comfort in what I, uh, when he says uh, that which I shall choose, I cannot tell. There are oftentimes I don't know what to pray for, like in the situation. I, I don't know what to pray. And I've heard that so much from our members who have a family member who is struggling uh, with their health. And they're like, Pastor, I don't know if I should pray that he gets better and, and all is well and he gets to come home. But because I know that 
that just means more suffering treatment? Or should I just pray that the Lord just come and take him? But I don't want to be apart from this, my parent or grandparent or spouse or child, you know, so they're struggling. I don't know which is, what What should I be praying for? It's like, we pray that the Lord's will be done. We pray honestly to the Lord and say, I don't know, Lord, but you know. Um, and, you know, we're encouraged in Romans 8. There are oftentimes we don't know what to even pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us, doesn't he? The Holy Spirit knows what we need. Um, so that's how I read it. It's like, well, which one should I be praying for? Should I be praying that I, you know, remain and I'm, uh, you know, delivered from this imprisonment to go and have fruitful labor? Or should I pray, Lord, just just take me, you know, let my martyrdom be a sign of the gospel and, and keep me uh, uh, through this uh, time of death and bring me to yourself. What should I pray for? I, I don't know. I don't even know what I should be hoping for. And it's like, well, <laughs> I do too. There are times where it's like, Lord, I don't know if I should be going left or right here. I, so I don't, if I pray to go left and that be, uh, should I even pray that? And so sometimes it's like, I'm just going to lay that before the Lord. I don't even know what's right here, Lord, but I know that you, you are right. You are the right. So I'm going to pray that to you because you are truth. So, um, yeah, that's how I see it. And, and he's struggling even in the fact of, um, of his imprisonment in the sense that he thinks he'll be delivered. He, he thinks it's, it's going to work out. It looks like it's working out. It looks like I'm going to be let go. But the one thing he doesn't want is to be ashamed, um, that this is Paul and what it would be ashamed that he wouldn't give faithful witness. Man, if he's going to be saying, well, I know my sinful nature, and I know sin, and I know the fallenness of our flesh, help me to be brave in the faith, not just brave for my sake, but have true bravery to stand up for what is true, so I wouldn't be ashamed. Um, but with full courage now and always in Christ. So um, that'd be our prayer, too. No matter if I uh, die or live, uh, let me never be ashamed and to bring shame to the gospel in uh in the weakness of faith and seeking my own instead of seeking uh to proclaim christ when he says that um and my desire is to to depart and be with christ for that is far better one of the ways that i've used this in my own ministry is you know i obviously encounter a lot of folks who are either in hospice and they don't know if they're going to wake up in the morning or maybe they're going under a very serious surgery and they don't they don't know if they're going to wake up after it or at the very least that's a fear and I try to use this to remind them that, you know, no matter what, in Christ, you're going to wake up. No matter what, no matter what, your your, your eyes are going to open. And they'll either open and you'll be with Christ, which technically is far better. Or, of course, you'll still be here, which is also great, you know. So, so even going into these moments when you're in Christ, you know, it doesn't mean you don't have fear. Of course you do. But that fear can be tempered just as Paul's, I'm sure, afraid. And so his fear is being tempered in the same way. Yes, my desire is just to be done with it, to be with Jesus. And I've felt that. But I also know that God has so much for me to do in this world. And it's not just about me, right? It's not just about me. It's about my neighbor. And, it, and this is another reason why the Christian faith cannot just be a me and Jesus thing. Because then you could just check out whenever you wanted and then just be with Jesus. But no, you're here for your neighbor. You're here for your family. You're here for uh, the, you're the strangers <laughs> next door. You're here uh, for a purpose, and, and Christ is going to be working with you. And, and Paul obviously realizes this because he says, convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because I'm going to come to you again. So, you know, he's, he's really leaning into this. You know, as I examine it, of course it's better for me to depart and be with Christ. It's, it's better for everybody. But I'm convinced that Christ is going to use my situation for his glory and your faith. And that's, that's something that we need to keep in mind. Yeah, it's, there's nothing that will fill you with uh, more joy, uh, more peace than when your members come back to you with the word of Christ. <laughs> I was with a, a member and his family gathered around his, his deathbed. And he turned to me, I walked in the room, I didn't expect him to be awake anymore. And he, he looked at me and he said, it's better to be with Jesus. I'm like, yeah, that is. Yep. And uh, we got to uh, receive the Lord's Supper together and and uh, that was just, just last week. So it was, uh, you know, when our members 
um, are uh, so, so filled with uh, the word of God that they can preach to us. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good Absolutely. day. Absolutely. And so well, while, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. sorry go ahead. Yeah. So, so we are, um, you know, we, like you said, we're not, are not fatalists in the sense like no. I just want to die. No, it's, I, I know what's my gain. I'm gaining, I'm gaining a kingdom. I'm gaining eternity. Death looks to take, and it's true for us on this side. It took, you know, it looks to take away from me, my father or mother or grandfather, my spouse, you know, it looks to take that away. And for that, we mourn while we look for our reuniting in the resurrection that we're never fully apart. We've, we're always united in Christ. So we, we want to talk, we want to embrace, and we look forward to that embrace in the resurrection. Though for that person, they are not receiving loss. Death for them, um, death looks to take, but it's, it's a gain. And that's what Jesus, that's what Paul says, you know, in Christ, uh, and, and to die is gain. We gain, um, where the devil looked to take from us. Our, our Lord puts death in submission to himself, uh, so that we actually gain. And that's, that's quite a joy. Now, in our last few verses, though, he does remind them that we have an obligation, though, while we're here. So verse 27, he says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come or and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw that I had, and now hear that I still have. And that, that ends the first chapter, although the thought continues because he continues by saying, so if there's any encouragement. So it, it keeps on going. Don't worry about the chapter divisions, folks. But for our sake, this is where we're going to end today. But he, he says, you know, you you first of all, we're reminded that you're going to have opponents, right? Christianity has opponents in this world. Uh, even the human opponents, which they generally are, uh, even the human opponents are people for whom Christ died, though. So it's not just about, you know, owning your opponents, to use modern language. It, it's about reflecting what Christ has done for you. So our manner of life, to be worthy of the gospel, even that is for the benefit not only ourselves, but also our neighbors. Yeah. Here he says, don't be afraid. In the face of the opponents, don't be afraid. Um, we have we have one, <laughs> one whom we fear, love, and trust in above all things. And it's not the opponents. It's not the devil. It's not the sinful nature. It's not the fallen world. We, we reserve that fear, love, and trust uh, for God alone. And when we stand before our opponents, not not hating them, not being afraid of them, but loving them as we are called to in Christ. Um, it's a sign to them of their just this is an end. We can't we can't have this person. We we uh we are lost. And to that you'd say, Yes, you this world is lost. So come. Um, be baptized, believe in Jesus, as he, he tells the the jailer, right? Believe. Um, be put to death and so that you can rise up again. In Christ Jesus, and and to trust to Him wholly and fully, yeah. We we have a, a call uh, as we live this life, living in a way that's worthy of the gospel, and that's that's a serious, sober call. Don't don't walk the way of the world, and don't walk in the manner of the world. But as you've been called out in Christ, as you've been given a new life, live it in Christ, live it, and uh, be eager and watching for His coming again. Yes, we have struggle. Yes, we have hardship, um, but but you also have Jesus uh, who struggled and suffered. And you, as you get ready for the next chapter, you got this great example of faith in the faithfulness of Jesus uh, who suffered for you, who was put to death for you uh, so that you may now live in his resurrection. So let us live. Let's live in Christ today and proclaim a living Christ who is above all things and everything has been subjected to him. So don't be afraid. Your Lord Jesus, he lives and you live now in him now and, and always.
I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. Pastor, thanks for coming. Thanks for doing all the heavy lifting, as you, as you, as you always do. You're such a great guest. Thank you, brother. Well, thank you and God's blessings and uh, get well soon. Thank you. Folks, tomorrow we're going to have another regular, Pastor Thomas Eckstein. He's going to open up for us Philippians 2, which offers a profound exploration of humility and unity within our Christian community, guided, of course, by the example of Jesus. The Apostle Paul urges believers in Philippi to adopt a selfless attitude and prioritize others above themselves. This chapter is renowned for its portrayal of Christ's humility and obedience, which serves as a model for us to emulate. And then Paul also discusses his plans to send uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus to Philippi, and he highlights their dedication and service to the gospel. And it, it blends all of this theological stuff with some practical advice, and it's all about love and unity and humility as the cornerstones of our Christian life. Lots to talk about tomorrow, that and more when we come back. So until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word. 